Greetings, everybody. Dr. Gina Colloy here with CEO Effectiveness, and incredibly privileged, humbled, and honored to have a legitimate world authority when it comes to health, well-being, diet, and exercise here with us today. So uh, we're going to take a deep dive. I'm going to introduce you to this gentleman and really take a, a, a clear path down the road that is optimal health, in particular when we're thinking about COVID-19. You know, I think all of us can, can uh, kind of sympathize with the fact that COVID, when it was first kicking off months ago, compared to where we are at right now, we're starting to see quite the elevation in folks who are being affected uh, by this disease. So being able to optimize our health, being able to put ourselves in a position to where we are as strong as possible is very, very important. So a little bit about myself. As you all know, my name is Dr. Gina Calorius, serial entrepreneur at heart. Um, I do hold a PhD in neuroanthropology from the University of South Florida. And I'm a seasoned executive coach. Uh, and truly where my expertise lies is creating bonds and organizations, leadership training and development, uh, as well as understanding how to enhance organizational culture. Now, Enough with me, let's switch it over to the, to the guest of the hour, which is Dr. Stephen Anton. Dr. Anton, how are you doing, sir? I'm good, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, doing fantastic. Really excited to be here. So thankful for you giving your time uh, to speak with us, share your expertise with our audience, and truly equip and empower folks who are tuning in with the skills and the knowledge that they need to stay safe, as safe as possible, um, and as healthy as possible uh, in these times. So I know we're gonna talk a lot about immune function. We're gonna talk a lot about energy, right? Being able to, to provide good sources of energy for our body and certain lifestyle, uh, things we should consider. So we're really excited uh, to have that discussion with you. I'm excited to be here. Outstanding. So, you know, one thing I'd like to do, if you don't mind, Dr. Anton, is I'd like to speak a little bit to your own background and your credentials. So I'm going to, uh, let's see here, there we go. All right, so, so I wanna share a little bit with you folks about Dr. Anton and, and, and what he has accomplished in his professional um, career up to this point. So first and foremost, he's an associate professor, professor and chief of clinical research uh, within the Institute of Aging at the University of, of Florida. Dr. Anton, is that, is that still correct? Well, it is until July 1st. Uh, at that point, I've become a full professor. Outstanding. Congratulations to you, sir. Congratulations Thank you. to you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anton has an incredible expertise in lifestyle factors that influence obesity, cardiovascular disease, and metabolic disease conditions. Uh, he has published over 150 scientific articles in medical journals, in addition to co-authoring the Man Diet, which is a science-based guide to optimizing health and vitality for men. So to say that Dr. Anton is very well accomplished it is quite uh, the understatement. So, you know, before we take a, a very deep dive into the six steps that, that promote optimal health, I do want to take a quick look and talk to you all about behavior, patterns of behavior, and underlying systems, or what we call here at CEO Effectiveness, mental models. So if we take a quick look at this iceberg, we'll see that the tip of the iceberg is, are those outward expressions, those outward behaviors. Those outward behaviors come from somewhere, right? And, and those are patterns of behavior, otherwise known as habits. Now, what forms are habits? Well, that comes from what we call underlying systems or mental models. So when you're thinking about the content that Dr. Anton is gonna dive into today, really think about the mental models and habits you have at play when it comes to your lifestyle when it comes to your diet, why you eat what you eat, why you do what you do, how you frame stress, all these things very much matter and ultimately come back down to your mental model or the, the perspective that you have shaped and crafted over your life course to get you to the conclusions that you hit uh, today, okay? So, uh, you know, it, today is really about not just optimizing health, but we want to give you some steps. You want to walk away from today. I know Dr. Anton's really passionate about this and having something, a, a, a set of skills and knowledge that can change your life for the better starting today. So number one, Dr. Anton, we're going to dive into this and, and I know you have a lot to elaborate on. So number one is mindfulness modification. 
So, so could you break that down for us? When you say mindfulness modification, what are we talking about? Uh, well, I like to think about uh, the concept of mindfulness in a different way than most people actually. I think you know the, the term mindful describes an idea that we, we have a lot going on in our brain. And actually, I think the opposite is often our goal to be become more mindless. By that, I mean to not think so much all the time and to be able to stay in a state of awareness. Uh, so many people spend so much of their mental energy thinking about the past or thinking about the future, and that distracts them from the present moment and where their real power could be and, and where the real full attention can be placed in the present moment, um, you can be so much more effective. And, mm -hmm. and so I think the modification I would have would be to, to try to bring your attention back to the present moment and take it to the extent possible away from the future oriented thoughts or the past oriented thoughts uh, that can distract and, and take away some of that mental energy. Wow. So the idea of kind of changing how we frame things in our mind, right? And the idea of being, you know, mindless as, as compared to mindful, that, that I'd never quite heard that before. And that's, that's profound. That really is profound. Um, you know, I think about the amount of stimuli that so many folks are surrounded with right now, right? With, with everything that's going on in this country, it is incredibly important to, to take a bit of time and do an inventory, right? From uh, being mindful, right? And what it is that we're mindless about um, and being able to put things uh, kind of in place or in check, so to speak, and, and perhaps shift priorities a bit, right? And what we dwell on, what we focus on and how we view the world. Do, do you have any um, quick things that someone could do to kind of help them re reshape or refocus how they are looking at something? Uh Sure. Uh, well, one thing is that just as a uh, kind of a clarifying point that being mindless doesn't mean you're incapable of thinking. It means yeah. you're fully engaged in the present. So when the thoughts come, they're based on your full uh, um, awareness of the moment and uh, engagement in the moment. And so what I think you could do is if you find yourself thinking about the future or you start to feel stressed, a lot of people say I'm stressed and the reason they're stressed a lot of times is because their thoughts are going into the future and yeah. those thoughts are about a, a negative future. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I would say is if you find yourself saying, oh, I'm feeling stressed, well, pay attention to your thoughts, where, where are your thoughts going? And then try to bring, up, bring your awareness back to the present moment. And unless you're being attacked by something, usually you can find some more peace at that right. moment because you're, you're present now. Absolutely. I think that, so that's incredible, right? So, so being present, be in the moment, be there, be, you know, be fully aware, be fully committed to that time where you're at and not having other things going on that will compound, right? To, to certain thought processes that you are having and emotions that you're feeling. Um, that's, that's incredibly profound. Okay. So mindfulness modification, that that's number one. So, you know, when we think about the, the second point, right? When, when we're, we're considering optimal health, um, we've talked a little bit about it, but it's, it's stress, right? <laughs> the incredible. I mean, stress can be a good thing, right? It can also be a not good thing. So, you know, what are some of your, your, your thoughts and your insights uh, when it comes to how to manage, navigate, um, and, and kind of go through the waters that, that is stress? Sure. And I, I like what you just said, that stress can be a good thing. Stress can not be a not so good thing. Uh, the truth of the matter is uh, we all need some stress because Stress is what helps our minds and bodies adapt, grow, become stronger, and become more resilient. So stress in itself is not a bad thing or necessarily something we should avoid. Right. We all know with exercise, which I think we'll talk about later, that if we never stress our muscles, what happens? They atrophy yeah. and they grow weak. And so we all need some level of stress. The, right. the real problem occurs when um, there's this quote chronic level of stress and what is stress? You know, that's, you can, we all think we know what stress is, but <laughs> what, what exactly is stress? Uh, right. I think my preferred definition of stress is, uh, <clears throat> what happens when we perceive the demands placed on us mm. to exceed our capabilities? Wow. And I'll say that again, that stress really only occurs when we perceive the demands placed on us to exceed our capabilities. And because we perceive something as, as you know, really challenging our own capabilities, 
we experience a state of um, over arousal or excessive arousal. And, and that's fine for a short period of time, but if it's a prolonged state of excessive arousal, that's, that can start to compromise our immune function, our ability to focus, our ability to sleep, and, and our ability to be effective. Yeah. You know, it's an amazing to I mean, perceived stress. When I think about folks you know, that we're working with here at CEO Effectiveness and, and how COVID-19 has impacted their, their, their day in, day out lives, stress is a really big deal. Um, you know, being able to, as a business owner, C-suite individuals, how they manage, how they navigate um, this situation, which has completely changed business models, right? Um, it, it's a heck of a thing to learn between mindfulness modification and stress management. It's a, it's a very powerful combination and, and to be able to understand um, that really is something that will serve as a guiding light or could serve you know, to, to be in a, a path where it's destructive if you're not able to understand um, kind of what those lines are and, and be able to find those optimal levels of drive in between the two. So uh, really, really great point. Really great point. So, all right, thinking about number three, right? So when we take a look at, uh, at number three, it's, it's sleep, right? Now, <laughs> I just love this slide. Look at this guy. He is out like a light, right? So, so sleep, I think everyone knows sleep's important, right? But, but I don't think folks realize just how important it actually is and kind of what sleep does for us and as well as what are the, the kind of minimum hours that you need to get to achieve an optimal level of, uh, of rest and performance. So please, Dr. Anton, if you could elaborate, sir. Oh, sure. Uh, well, what we, we talked about in points one and two, I think have direct implications for how well we sleep. <clears throat> if we're mindful, meaning we're thinking a lot about the past or the future, uh, our brain's going to, our mind's going to be going rapidly and, and have a hard time relaxing when we go to bed. And then if we're also quote unquote stressed, our body may be going rapidly, our heart rate speeding, our blood pressure's up. And that combination would make it hard to get a good night's rest. And we all know the value of a good night's rest, how, how when we sleep well, meaning um, through the night and we wake up feeling rested, we function so much better, both emotionally, uh, physically, mentally, all, all of the above. It just our days tip, typically go much better, at least mine do. I oh no, I'm right there with you. If, if I sure. don't, <laughs> if I don't get enough sleep, it, it's, it's not a good day. <laughs> it, so it's, we, we, I think we all can in, agree that it's uh, very important to sleep well and get a good night's sleep. Uh, yeah. To your question, you know, what, how much sleep do we need? Uh, yeah. Well, I think, I think that varies by, by each person. Uh, you know, science will, will often say the optimal amount of sleep is seven to nine hours. Right. And probably for most people, that's true, but it doesn't have to be true for everybody. And I think it, it, it varies um, on a lot of factors. And, and one of those factors is also how well you align your sleep with your body's natural circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. When we sleep in line with our natural circadian rhythms, we get deeper sleep, better quality sleep, and we may or may not need as much sleep because of the quality of the sleep that we're getting. And, and for most people, that means, you know, sleeping shortly after it's the uh, night has occurred and, and the, it is dark outside. Uh, what exactly that time is, is to, you know, everybody's a little bit individual in terms of their, their biorhythms. But for most people, I recommend trying to get to sleep before 11 p.m. if yeah. possible. It's not yeah. always possible, but if possible, yes. Now, you know, it, it's so interesting when I think about times where, um, at, Looking back at my life course to this point, I've had sleeping schedules all over the place. There's been times where I didn't go to bed till 1, 1 1.30, and that was normal for me. And then there's times that bedtime became 9.30 at night, right? And the difference between the two. But you're, it, it's, it is um, kind of, you, you have to touch and go with it because depending on life factors, what's going on, what's driving, being mindful, what am I being mindful of that doesn't allow me to kind of slow down. Um, or I don't allow it to, to happen. It's a choice, right? I mean, they're, they're all questions of discipline and mental framing, which does go back to, to, to mindfulness modification um, mm -hmm. and kind of the role and the importance that we put on sleep and as a priority. So long and the short though, ladies and gentlemen, sleep, very important. Seven to nine hours is what is average for most people to feel rested. Is that correct? Generally sir? speaking, for most people, 
having said that, I also think it's important to pay attention to what we're telling ourselves, both before we go to sleep and when we wake up. Yeah. Uh, you know, it doesn't help to say, oh, I feel so tired as soon as I wake up. Even, you know, let's just say you didn't get those seven to nine hours, which we know life happens and we know it's right. not always possible. Right. So it's really important to pay attention to the words you're saying to yourself when you wake up. And one of the, you know, if you didn't sleep as well as you'd hoped, you could say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, do well today, even though I didn't sleep as well as I wanted. Something like that. Just Absolutely. pay attention to the words you're saying. Yeah. That's really important. Almost like a, a primer for the day of sorts, right? And that they, that's, um, that's an incredibly powerful thing, an incredibly powerful thing. Okay, fantastic. So, you know, when we shift out of sleep and, and we take a look at what number four is on this list, right? I mean, and, and I, I love the, the look of this food. It's making me hungry just looking mm -hmm. at it. The ketogenic lifestyle, and I think one of the big things here is to understand the, the word lifestyle and, and kind of what that means and how it plays out with the definition of it being ketogenic. So if you could break this down for us, Dr. Anton, um, you know, I, I know it would be extremely helpful. Sure. Uh, so the reason we say ketogenic lifestyle is, is because it's not just about a ketogenic diet, that our, our whole lifestyle influences um, the level of ketones that our body is producing. And what are ketones? They're, they're supercharged energy molecules, I call them, because they provide uh, the body with more energy than uh, the typical glucose molecule that most of us run off of. And, and the reason uh, it's a lifestyle is because science has now, sh now showed us that there's a number of ways in which we can enhance the level of ketones in our, in our body, including intermittent fasting, exercise, the ketogenic diet, and even taking exogenous ketones are, are four different ways that um, the level of ketones in our blood and brain uh, can be increased. And so when you put those together into a lifestyle, that can be a really powerful combination. So it's really interesting. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of folks have heard of the, the keto diet, right? Um, but, but, you know, we're talking a little bit more about something that's a little bit different, right? As far as it being a lifestyle, right? And what goes into to being able to make it sustainable, right? Being able to do it day in day out to get the optimal results to ultimately achieve um, optimal effectiveness in making your body as strong as it can possibly be. I think that word is a key word, sustainable, because, yes. uh, you know, and I, we'll probably talk about this. If it's, if it's not something that you can sustain, then, then it's really not worth spending a lot of time uh, trying to change. Because of ultimately, if it's not sustainable, it's not going to have the long-term benefits. Yeah. Right. And I think so many folks have seen, you know, through the years, I mean, take your pick of different diet fads, right, that have been out there um, that are not evidence-based, right? And now you have something um, where, where science has taken a deep dive, right, in, into the ketogenic lifestyle and shown the benefits. Uh, it's very telling and it's very promising, including your own research. So that's, uh, that, that's really great. So, you know, shifting gears, when we think about um, looking at number five, right, and what goes in to having a clear understanding of, of exercise. You know, this is another thing. I think there's so many different schools of thought. There's so many different ways to go about doing this. What, what, what is the role of exercise when it comes to optimal health and optimal performance as a human being? Oh, you know, I think I'd, I'd start by saying it has a fundamental role. Uh, and by exercise, though, I think we want to recognize that exercise can mean so many different things. And uh, it can mean everything from doing yoga in the morning to going for a walk after eating to doing some high intensity running to weightlifting and, and or simply stretching at, at night. And the truth of the matter, in my opinion, is that all of those are really beneficial. Yeah. Uh, does that mean that you have to do them all? No. Uh, but does it mean that you probably would benefit from all of them? Yes. And I think that, um, what we were saying before is really important in the sense that if it's sustainable, that is what um, is optimal. And, and by that, I mean, when we think about what's, what's the best exercise, you know, the, what I usually tell people is it's the, the one you'll do, the mm. one you'll do over and over. <laughs> That's the best exercise. And, then, <laughs> and what we talked about earlier with stress, you know, you want that exercise 
ideally to be a little bit stressful, enough, at least enough stressful that it induces a, a positive adaptation on the mind and body so that you're, you're no, now have adapted and become a little bit stronger, a little bit more resilient after that exercise. So um, does that mean every exercise session has to be really challenging? No, but it, as a rule, you want to have some exercise sessions that are challenging so that your body can adapt. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's so funny when you say adapt and, and something that you're going to do. About a year ago, I tried hot yoga with my wife and it was definitely not sustainable. <laughs> well, you know, you probably experienced um, such a challenge to your your system that you, oh, yeah. your body just needed time to adapt. Absolutely. And, and probably a lot of people would have that same reaction if you go from never doing hot yoga to doing whatever, an hour of hot yoga, yeah. that would be really challenging and a dramatic yeah. change from where you started probably yeah. as of not doing it. And oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a big guy, right? So, so me getting on a, on a yoga floor in a 105 degree room, I mean, it, 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 uh, it was great. I understood the concept behind it, but to your point, it wasn't something that I felt was sustainable, but you also raise another point to that is I didn't give myself time to adapt to it. That's the, that's the point I also want to really make is that too many people conclude too quickly that they can't do something because maybe their body isn't quite ready to do, you know, the three mile run, right? But maybe it is ready to do a half a mile run. Absolutely. And then if you can expand on that half a mile gradually, maybe over time it will be ready for that three mile run. Exactly. Now exactly. I'm speaking personally, but I, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, love it. That's fantastic. All right. So, so exercise, key component, right? When, when we're thinking about um, optimal levels of performance and, and as well as having a robust immune system and, and protection from things like COVID. So let, let's switch gears to uh, the last pillar for, for our time together. And that's intermittent fasting, right? I think that, uh, you know, we've talked about a ketogenic lifestyle. Uh, we, we've talked about exercise, but intermittent fasting is something that's, a, it, it's, a little bit different, right? And I think some folks have heard of it, but they may not quite understand the science behind it and why it's so important. So please, Dr. Anton, if you could elaborate. Sure. Intermittent fasting is, uh, you know, a term that has grown so much in popularity over the last uh, few years, probably second only maybe to the ketogenic diet. And what we first need to say is that that term can mean a lot of different things. It's similar to exercise. You say exercise and we, you know, a hundred different people would have a hundred different ideas probably of what exactly we're talking about. And, you know, it's not quite that many with intermittent fasting, but there's a lot of different ways to quote intermittently fast. Right. Uh, you know, there, so to focus in a little bit, uh, the two most popular that I believe are, are out there are what's called um, time restricted eating, mm -hmm. where every day you fast for an extended period of time, typically 14 to 16 hours, and you eat for a shorter period of time, generally eight to 10 hours. Mm -hmm. In contrast to what most Americans do, or, or most people in the world do, is you know, eat for 12 or more hours per, per day. Uh, right. So the time-restricted feeding, I think, is what most people associate now with intermittent fasting, where it's every sure. day you, you shorten the eating window. And for example, would eat from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. pretty much every day. And, and of course, if, if uh, on the weekends people felt like that wasn't sustainable or, or something they wanted to do, that's okay. It's kind of like exercise. The more often you do it, the better, but you don't have to do it every day to get the benefits. Um, the other popular type of intermittent fasting is um, alternate day fasting, where it is what it sounds like, where you literally fast a whole day and night until the next day where you basically consume food as much as you want uh, yeah. until the next day where you get then fast again and alternate every day. And, and that's a very popular way for some people, but I think for the majority of people, the time restricted eating is the type of intermittent fasting that um, they naturally gravitate to yeah. and feel that it's more sustainable. Um, and I think the reason, the reasons why, you know, I'm, I'm excited. There's, there's many reasons why I'm excited by the health benefits of intermittent fasting. J one of which is that you see such overlap in the biological changes that occur 
while somebody's fasting as occur from exercise. Mm -hmm. At the cellular level, your mitochondrial function is improving. Your body's ability re to remo remove waste products is increased. Yeah. Uh, that's called autophagy. Mm -hmm. And so you're producing greater energy and you're removing waste products and you're enhancing your, your brain's uh, brain derived neurotrophic factors so you're enhancing your brain function at the same time and and so there's a lot of just great benefits that are occurring at the whole mind body level from intermittent fasting so that's incredible i mean from an evidence-based perspective i have never heard uh and of course this is not my specialty but you know a, a program or a way of approaching eating um that will have all those benefits uh, i think that that's an incredible it's almost as if we were designed our bodies were designed to, to, to have that sort of an experience with food? Well, you know, when you look at our, our history as a species, a, a human species, I, I, you know, show a graph oftentimes that shows for the majority of our existence as a human species, we've eaten one or t two meals a day. Right. It's only really in the last um, 500 years that we've now gravitated towards eating three or more meals plus snacks every day. Now, people might argue that's because uh, of the environment and that's true to some degree but at the same time to your point you know i think we have evolved with an ability to go long periods of time without eating and our body has a natural ability to switch something we wrote about called the metabolic switch the energy source from glucose to ketones and when you do that you produce these broad array of systemic benefits for the mind and body and so i think um we were designed to yeah. eat in this manner. <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you think about optimal performance, I mean, and I know this is also tied to our immune function as well, right? I mean, the idea of being able to create a robust uh, immune system to where your cells, your mitochondria, all, all those things, they have what they need. Uh, could you speak a little bit to that about the role of the immune system as far as it, how it correlates to intermittent fasting? Absolutely. And so, you know, what I, I, I started to talk about the, at the cellular level, you're removing waste products you're enhancing your mitochondria, you're shifting the energy source. And when you, when you take away um, the metabolic challenge that's associated with eating, you've actually reduced the burden on the immune system by eating less frequently. Because every time we eat, our body produces waste products, metabolic mm -hmm. waste products. And those waste products can lead to increased levels of inflammation in the blood. Wow. And our body has to deal with that. And mm -hmm. And so by A, by just simply eating less frequently or less often, um, your demand on your system is reduced. At the same time, your body goes through this regenerative process where it's shifting into using uh, ketones for energy, which produce less, less waste products and act as uh, natural antioxidants in the blood and body. So overall, it really, I think, can help greatly enhance the immune system and, and reduce the burden that's placed on it every day. You know, if you don't mind, Dr. Anti, you said something that I think is so many folks can relate to, but inflammation, right? And, and, and the role of inflammation. Um, when you're talking about reducing inflammation based off of a certain pattern of, of, of dieting, right? Um, why is it that there's a correlation there? Well, what we know is that, you know, when we, as I was mentioning, every time we eat our our blood sugar goes up and our when our glucose mm -hmm. levels go up after a meal that's directly associated with levels of inflammation because um to try to explain it at the cellular level there's waste products produced by our cells our cells are like our little bodies they're um they're taking in energy but they're also excreting waste products and those waste products can challenge the function of the cells in the whole body and that can start to lead to this inflammation in the blood when mm. we have too much and and i'm hoping that's clear that it, it it then leads to what's called systemic systemic inflammation which we know is associated with a lot of bad outcomes oh so, yeah yeah that's all i just learned something new that's cool awesome that's fantastic cool. all right so so that's all six pillars so so let's um, hop into a, a quick recap of, of all six uh, for everyone, okay? So let, let's take a look. So number six, 
uh, was obviously intermittent fasting. When we go back to number one, so mindfulness modification, a big thing that Dr. Anton touched on, ladies and gentlemen, was the idea of being mindful and mindless, right? Mindless, not meaning that you're not thinking, but it means that you're present. You're in the moment, right? You're able to kind of tone the volume down on all the other thoughts, all the other stimuli, and really be present in that moment. Uh, number two, stress reduction, right? So, so being able to put stress in its place. Again, remember, Dr. Anton said there's good stress and not so good stress, right? And it's a simple question of how we're framing what it is that we are dealing with. Number three, sleep. There is no set perfect time of, of what that gap should be as far as seven to nine hours. Uh, it, it does depend on the individual, but science has shown that seven to nine hours is, is pretty average for folks to get the optimal level uh, of, of sleep. And then a ketogenic lifestyle, right? Understanding that there's a big shift between having glucose, right? Supply the energy to your body as opposed to ketones, right? Now, real quick, Dr. Anton, does that mean that folks, um, that when you, when you switch to a ketogenic lifestyle, does glucose kind of go out the window? Does it still have a role? What does that look like? Uh, it will almost always still have a role that our, our bodies are, are built like um, hybrid cars. We have the ability to use both glucose and ketones as yeah. an energy source uh, and, and shift between the two. Uh, but the, the, the real issue is that the vast majority of us don't, don't shift. We just stay in the glucose cycle uh, by eating very frequently, not moving too often, and also eating higher carbohydrate, high sugar diets. Yeah. Right which I know is abound. It's, it's everywhere. Um, all right. So very helpful. So then now, now number five is exercise, right? Do, do the exercises that are sustainable. And to Dr. Anton's point, what, whatever it is that you're actually going to go do, stick to it, grow in it, adapt, challenge yourself uh, because the benefits are, are, are limitless. And then finally, intermittent fasting, right? Which is what we have been talking about, which is that time restricted feeding. Now, Dr. Anton, if someone has never done intermittent fasting before, where's a good place for them to start as far as a fast window? Uh, real good question. And, and similar to exercise, I think um, it's going to be individualized because some people may naturally eat, uh, let's say, 11 hours, or maybe some people eat 13 hours a day. And so the person who naturally eats 11 hours is going to start in a different place than the person who eats 13 hours. Um, but for whatever that person's baseline level of eating is, I would say just to start slowly, try to maybe um, push back the first meal by 15 to 30 minutes and maybe push up the last meal by 15 to 30 minutes, see how the body feels, see how the, you know, that feels emotionally. <laughs> and if that doesn't feel so challenging, you know, or, or after the body has adapted, then maybe then move towards pushing it back again by 15 to 30 minutes. And, and same thing until, you know, you get closer to the, to the ideal window that works for you best. Sure. Yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So fantastic. Well, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for giving us your time. You know, today was about getting those six pillars of understanding what optimal health should and could look like for you, especially in these trying and tumultuous times as we all kind of navigate and figure out this whole entire pandemic. We want you to stay strong. We want you to be healthy uh, and we want you to be optimized. So Dr. Anton, thank you so much for your time, your sure. expertise, your professionalism, uh, truly an insightful conversation and, and so many takeaways uh, that I think, you know, th those six things folks can walk off from watching this webinar and, and really be able to apply some incredible things to, to make themselves stronger and, and, and enhance your immune function. So thank you very, very much. You're welcome, my pleasure. Outstanding. And ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions for Dr. Anton or the team here at CEO Effectiveness, please feel free to email me directly. And you can get to my email from our website, www.ceoeffectiveness.com. You'll also see our website on our YouTube page on the uh, description of the page itself. So Dr. Gina Kalua here signing off. Thank you all so much for your time. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you guys soon.